On behalf of 24HourAnswers.com, I welcome you to today's lesson. In this video, we're going to look at some basic properties of limits. And you're given three functions here, f of x, g of x, and h of x. And we want to uh, apply some properties of limits. And for the most part, they work the way you think they should work. We have to be careful when we divide to avoid denominators of zero. But for the most part, it's direct substitution unless you run across, you know, a zero in your denominator. Or in some cases, we'll see this later too, where you have the square root of a negative number. Obviously, we cannot do that. But for these examples here, I want to get the basic ideas across and to make you feel more comfortable with limits. So problem number one, the limit of f of x as x approaches 4 is equal to what? Well, f of x is equal to 2. So really all this is saying is the limit as x approaches 4 of this constant function, because f of x is equal to 2. Well, here's a rule about constants. The limit of a constant is the constant, regardless of what x is approaching. So this answer is going to be 2. This is the y value that we're going to be approaching as x approaches 4. Let's look at a graph. So I have f of x equals 2 over in Desmos, and I'm just going to take this little red marker, and I'm going to let x approach 4. So notice x is getting close to 4. But notice that y value is never changing because the limit of a constant function is the constant. So that's why our limit's 2. Regardless of what we're approaching here, the x value, it does not matter. The y value remains constant. Hence, the limit of a constant is the constant. In our second example, we have the limit of g of x plus h of x as x approaches 3. Now, this is a little overkill, but what you can do when you add two functions together and we're trying to find the limit, we can split this up into two pieces. So I can say the limit of g of x as x approaches 3, this piece here, plus the limit of h of x as x approaches 3. Yes, you can do this with limits. And now we can apply direct substitution to each individual function. You know, the g here and the h here. Let's plug 3 into both of them since that's what we were finding originally. And up here, plugging in 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 minus 1 is 8. So we get 8 when we plug 3 into g of x using direct substitution. Add plus right here, plugging in 3 here for h, h of x. 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 3 is 6. 6 minus 2 gives us 4. So now we can add these two things together and we get a limit of 12. So that's one of your other properties. Now I want to show you this on the graph in a slightly different approach. So notice that I have G and H both graphed over here in Desmos, but I'm just going to take this one here because remember we were taking G of X plus H of X. So I'm going to hide those two there and I'm going to take my dot and I'm going to let this dot, I'm going to let that X value of around 1.68, I'm going to let that get close to three and let's see what Y value we get close to. So I'm letting X get close to three right now. We're at around 2.87 ish, 2.9 ish getting closer and closer and closer to three and I just passed over it, but look right there. Notice when we hit three, we actually have a Y value of 12 and that is our limit. And what I'm trying to show you here is that yes, I can add these two functions together as you see right here and I can still get that same limit that we got using direct substitution where we substituted into each function individually. But then again, looking at the graph here, as we get closer to 3, notice that y value is getting real close to 12. So that is our limit for g of x plus h of x as x approaches 3. In our third example, the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 times g of x, well, we can do the same thing we did in the previous example where we can just do direct substitution. And all I'm really going to do here is take 2, that 2 right there, and I'm going to multiply it by whatever I get when I plug 1 into g of x. So plugging 1 into here, into our g of x function, 3 times 1 is 3, minus 1 gives us 2. So 2 times 2 gives us a limit of 4. That is our limit for example number 3. Let's have a quick look at the graph for this one. So here's our g of x, this line here, but recall in that example that we just did, we took two times g of x. So I'm gonna hide the blue curve and now we have this purple line and I'm gonna let x get close to one. So x is getting close to one somewhere in here, right? If you look at that x value and look at the y value that we're getting close to. 
As a matter of fact, when I hit one exactly, look at that y value. That y value is four, which is exactly the limit that we got in example number three. The fourth and fifth examples, this is one case where you wanna be careful and you will run across this quite often in limits where you may end up getting a denominator equal to zero. Now, how do we handle that? We'll talk about that in a future video, but I don't want you to make the assumption that it's always gonna be an issue. For example, this first one here, the limit as X approaches five of G of X over H of X. You still want to try direct substitution. Uh, and what we can do here is we can take this five, let's plug it into G of X, that's gonna be our numerator here. So plug it in five, three times five is 15, minus one gives us 14, over, and yes, we can try and directly substitute five into H. So plug in five into our H of X, five squared is 25, minus five is 20, minus two gives us 18. Therefore, when we simplify this, we get seven over nine. That is gonna be our limit as X approaches five of G of X over H of X. Let's look at that graph real quick. So our G of X and H of X are both graphed here, but recall we were doing G of X divided by H of X, a completely different looking function, of course, but we were letting X approach five. And let me show you this, check this out. What was our limit? Our limit as X approaches five, we actually got a value of, what was it? Seven over nine. And look at that red dot right there. That red dot sits on this black curve, G of X over H of X. That's exactly the Y value that we're getting close to as X gets closer and closer to five. And notice when we hit five, we're around 0.778. As a matter of fact, that's exactly seven ninths. Seven ninths is 0.7 repeated. So as you can see, that red dot is sitting right exactly at five comma seven ninths and seven ninths was the limit that we got when we divided these two functions here. And last but not least, plugging two into our G of X and H of X, plugging two into G, we get three times two is six, minus one gives us five over, let's take two and plug it into H, two squared is four, four minus two is two, minus two more gives us zero. This is where we have something weird going on. Now, I mentioned in an earlier video about the limit does not exist. That may be the case, that may not be the case. Uh, for now, we will look at this on the graph, but we will be talking about these particular cases more in future videos as well. Let's have a look at the graph. So we have the same G of X over H of X as we had in example four, and now we have it in example five. But now we are approaching a different X value. The X value that we want to approach now is two. Well, this is where X is equal to two because we got two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and I can actually zoom in a little bit and probably show this a little bit better to you right here. Um, so now we got zero, one, two, three, four, five. So two is right here. Well, notice as we get close to two, this graph shoots off to infinity. Now this is coming in from the right hand side. We shoot off to positive infinity. Coming in from the left hand side, as we get closer and closer to this X value of two here, we're shooting down to negative infinity. This is called a vertical asymptote. Again, another key concept that we will be talking about in a future tutorial. But for now, I do want you to see we are not approaching a specific Y value. As a matter of fact, we're shooting off to positive infinity from the right and negative infinity to the left. This is an example of when the limit does not exist. So therefore, for this particular example, we would say, uh, typically I just write DNE for does not exist, but you don't always want to make the assumption that just because you get zero in the denominator, that the limit does not exist. That is not always gonna be the case. Again, that will be coming in future tutorials as well, especially when we start uh, evaluating limits by factoring or maybe even rationalizing, uh, doing a little bit of algebra to evaluate some limits. And there you have it, five examples covering some of the basic properties of limits. One of the key things not to forget here is that very first one, the limit of a constant is the constant. Constants come up a lot in calculus, uh, especially when we get into differentiation. Uh, there's a rule you wanna remember there for derivative. But for now, I, I wanna get the idea across that limits do work the way you think they should work. Direct substitution works great. Just keep an eye out for denominators that are zero. And again, we'll cover that more in a future tutorial. And that's it for this video. I hope it helped. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel for more videos. 
Links to our social media are in the description below.